Hello, I'm Dave Sherwin, an English teacher in New Jersey, and you are listening to Got Tech, the podcast. Welcome back to Got Tech, the podcast, episode number six, Snow Day. In this episode, we have our first in-studio live guest, David Sherwin, join us to talk with us about our district's future forward thinking way of handling snow makeup days. We look at our question of the day involving how to choose the right ed tech tools to incorporate into a teacher's lessons. We play technology feud with our guests. And finally, Nick and I square off in another tech battle royale where we go over two ed tech resources that every teacher should own. Hey, welcome back, everybody. We got a special treat today. Not only is Nick here. Hi, Nick. What's up, Eric? We also have another teacher from our district, Dave Sherwin. He's an English teacher. Dave, how's it going? It's awesome. Thanks so much, gentlemen, for this opportunity to sit in. Thanks for coming on. Today's uh, episode is uh, Snow Days. And we had a lot of them this year. We had six. It seemed like every time it snowed, our superintendent came on, gave us a clever little video message about how there's too much white stuff out there. We're going to stay home and, and build snowmen. So today we're going to talk a little bit about how we handled these snow days. And we did something new this year. And I think it went over pretty well, but we'll get into it. We had six snow days. We had three built in to the end of our schedule. And now we had to make up two or three at various spots. So typically we have our spring break the first week in April every year. And this year we were supposed to lose Thursday and Friday to make up for those snow days. Our board of education, our administration got together, put their heads together and came up with e-learning days where we as teachers were able to provide students with a technology driven lesson through our LMS, our learning management system. So I just want to kind of go over to Nick and Dave a little bit and their experiences with this because as the media and tech specialist, I worked with teachers to help them make sure that they were prepared for these days. You guys actually had to implement it. So Nick, uh, why don't you start us off a little bit on what you did during these snow day e-learning days? Sure. I pretty much asked my students in place of being in school and going through a, a normal lesson where they would come in with me and I would present some sort of content to them and they would either do an activity or perform some kind of an experiment and analyze that data. Um, I wanted them to be able to sort of mimic that same thing just from their homes. That was kind of the whole idea is let them do an equivalent amount of work at home as they would have done were they in class on those two makeup snow days. And for me, the obvious answer was uh, have them watch a very short video to kind of gain some, some sort of information that they would have seen in class. So I kind of scoured YouTube a little bit. I can never quite find exactly what I'm looking for on YouTube for my, um, my chemistry classes. It's either just a little bit too advanced for them or a little bit not advanced enough. I don't know. I just like, I like to be right in the sort of the sweet spot for what I want my kids to know. So I just put together a quick little PowerPoint and I recorded it with Screencast-O-Matic, which I like to do because I've just got a lot of experience with that. It was maybe three, four minutes long. I had my students watch that. I gave them some, not guided notes, but some directions on the types of things that they should be taking notes on. And then after they watched the video, they just took a little online assessment with our LMS and it automatically graded that assessment for them. So I didn't really have to do anything. After they all took the assessment, I just kind of logged in and their their scores were there. And when we were back in school after our, our full spring break, we just kind of talked about uh, what they saw and what they thought about it. And I, I thought it was fantastic. I know people had mixed reviews, but I, I thought it was really super successful. And uh, I think the kids appreciated the ability and the chance to do that, which for sure, at least to me, would seem way better than having to come to school. So, so, so it's kind of like, forget about the school, forget about the walls. Just take the stakeholders from both situations, you and your students. They still got you through the video and the students still were able to complete work and then get feedback on that work. Yeah, I mean, it was it was great. Actually, the content I had them, the video was on a thing that I had actually never even taught in class before. I've just never had time for 
for it. So it sort of even felt to me like they were getting to learn some extra different stuff that we've never done. So that part was uh, really, really uh, cool for me to see. N1 AP chemistry right there. So Dave, let's go over to you a little bit. Dave, you're an English teacher. Yep. All right. So anyone that knows Dave, he goes outside of the norm a little bit. He tries to include new things into his practice. Like Nick, Dave was uh, teacher of the year last year and Nick was teacher of the year this year. So uh, not to put you on the spot, why don't you give us a go at what you did for your e-learning days? Well, uh, I will say too, like Nick was talking about the markers of success. 100% of the students followed through on this assignment, which was, you know, for any normal assignment, you'd, you'd be very happy about that. Uh, so that was interesting to see. I tried to go with two different approaches. One was with my English one, like freshman year English classes, for them to continue to carry through. They were in the process of writing. They were drafting. And so I said, all right, let's just continue with that. They could collaborate online read each other's drafts, offer comments and feedback. Overall is a success. The one challenge is if they didn't get to it, if they were away or if they, you know, uh, didn't do it in the exact time that I had asked because of other circumstances that got in the way a bit. However, we were able to have them hand in their final drafts a few days after the break, which was cool. The other approach I did was enrichment, a lot like the flip classroom that Nick was talking about. Look for TED Talks, some things, our literature, we were talking about refugees, sort of the story of people from from different parts of the planet. And so we listened to people share their stories through TED Talks, and then they offered reflections. That I felt like was entirely successful and just a a great way to enrich what we were already doing in the classroom. So I I think that's just another example of of good practice while being not in the physical classroom. And you guys kind of talked about some of the pros and some of the cons, but I'm thinking to myself, when would we have to make up these days? It would be the last couple of days after exams when people are pretty much checked out. I guess the question is, do they get more out of it at the beginning of April? Big time. Yeah, then, you know, at the end of the year. I mean, it seems like it's a win-win. They can still go on that vacation during spring break that they scheduled way back in August or they can come in after everything's pretty much wrapped up for the year and do seat time. Yeah, I thought this was uh, an an amazing solution for that exact reason. At least in April everybody's still focused if the when you add extra snow days on to the end of the year it's I mean, it checks a box, but I don't know if those are really uh, learning-filled days because everyone. the end of the year is crazy. Everyone's focused on graduation, and it's just the, the same amount of learning is definitely not happening. So at least doing it this way, uh, even though the, the students weren't in school, at least they had some way to you know interact with, uh, with us, and we got to sort of provide information to them or ask them to do some enriching activities like Dave said. I, th- I thought it was awesome. I thought it was so awesome. I actually came up with this whole plan. It's very controversial. I, I'm not sure the response I'm going to get here from you guys, but I emailed one of our admin people over at the board office, and I said that every we should start a new plan for the school year where every Monday or every Wednesday is always an e-learning day. Kids do not come to school. So the way it would work is pretty much a three-day weekend, but during that Monday or that Wednesday, the students have to log in and they have to be showing some signs that they're completing their school assignments at home on that day. And teachers don't have to come in until the afternoon. So during the afternoon is when we show up, so you get to sleep in a little bit, take your time. And afternoon is for students to show up at the school building and get extra help, almost like a recitation period. Boom. There's a couple really neat concepts with that. (laughs) But I will tell you that Dave and I talked about similar situations where this could be just a trickle down effect to, you know, maybe the absence of a physical teacher in the classroom. And that has to come across your mind. Dave, you look like you want to kind of jump in there. So I'm going to let you go ahead. Uh, First, I'm going to have to say that I have been jealous of my brothers, uh, other people I know who have those work at home days. Just that, you know, the pacing of their life is can be so much different different when they have that so along those lines nick I, i'm on board yeah does it open a can of worms perhaps well i don't know and I, it, that's where we'd have to really look at what happens in the classroom and how do we protect that interaction and the importance of being in the same room but if it were done really wisely and it were a supplement and not like a substitution where we changed it out we're not going to a, a cyber school there's some potential there I, I like how you frame that nick that there's there's some cool things happening in that idea yeah i think think yeah if you if you were to you're absolutely right if you were to do it you'd have to have really strong commitment from people that you know that's not what the school's gonna become and I guess 
guess I was just assuming that that wouldn't happen only because the school building's here. It's not going away. I think most people would agree that the the face-to-face interaction is the most important thing. And you couldn't, I don't think personally, you can trade that out for uh, an online school. I mean, I know some online schools are very successful and people get a great education that way. But at least in the high school setting, I think you have to build relationships with the individual students. You have to be there face-to-face. But I still think just that one day a week I don't know. It sounds pretty awesome. I, there's a lot of a lot of things you could do with that one day. For example, uh, students that miss a lot of time could come in and get a lot of help. And I, I agree that that is a, definitely a bonus when you really think about this. Uh, I, I'm telling you, there's there's a lot of people that's going to have reservations about this idea. And believe it or not, I've this isn't the first time I've heard this idea. But as teachers, I mean, our job is to get students ready for the next level of college. And that's not just on an educational platform that's also a social platform they need to be able to speak interact communicate advocate for themselves and that's how that's what they get when they're in person and i feel like that will be a lost art if we keep going to too many of those e-learning days however one isn't detrimental i don't think right and maybe we commit to this to a year maybe schools don't commit to this to a year who knows but i I think we're definitely on to something yeah i think that's going to wrap up this segment with snow days and e-learning i'm interested any other schools out there try this I, I'd really like to hear from you. You guys can uh, definitely reach out to us on Twitter at We Got Tech. It's definitely something that's going to be in the conversation for sure. You can follow Got Tech outside the podcast at gottech.com or on Twitter at We Got Tech. It's time for the teacher tech question of the day. And this was actually an email that we received from one of our colleagues who wants to remain anonymous. So we're going to honor his or her wishes. The question reads, you two have talked about a lot of technology over the first five episodes. What are some characteristics you look for when selecting technology to talk about? It's a great question. It's uh, one thing I think we struggle with. I don't know if we struggle with it, but it's definitely... On the forefront of our minds, at least it is mine, because if you're going to talk about these things and share them with people, you want it to be useful and 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 as helpful as possible, because at least in my mind, I don't know how you feel about it, but if we're pushing stuff out there that is not good, that that's not going to help and people aren't going to want to listen. So I think we go over this a lot. I know one thing for me, and I just ran into this problem this past week with something I was trying for the first time, which maybe I'll talk about, is being affordable. So many of the tech stuff out there right now, it's it's free, at least for a portion. You know what I mean? They give you the month free trial, which is nice, but you don't want to start incorporating something into your classroom that's going to start upcharging you a month later, or maybe even it's free for like some of the features, but to get the pro version, you got to start paying. So we try and choose free stuff whenever possible. I get that. We can't blame it on those companies that want to charge money and actually- uh, No, I get it. I mean, they're businesses. The House of Ed Tech, uh, Chris Ness, he just uh, had a little segment on this. Go over and listen to that a little bit. And okay. his major theme was, hey, there's a lot of people supporting this. There's a lot of people that put time in there to make sure that the technology is running and that they're providing a service. Yeah, affordability is definitely something that we have to take into consideration. Another thing along those lines is if it's something new, if it's a new flavor to education, if it is something that has not had anything out there that could do something similar to it, then yeah, that that should be a premium if it's something that is that good affordability is definitely a characteristic you got to look at but uh i i think how you implement it and how easy it is to be integrated yep i i have tons of teachers that are interested in doing tech if it's easy to integrate if it's not easy they're not interested well yeah nobody i mean we're all super busy well i've been dealing with the past couple of weeks trying to make a whole like a personalized tech-based unit for my chemistry classes and it's just so time consuming to create these materials and like we've talked about before I'm willing to do it because once it's done it's done and it's and I'm putting the a lot of time in so it's good everything's the way I want it from the start I guess is what I'm trying to say so I don't have to put in this time next year because it's just made and I can just add to it and make it better but because of that we spend so much time creating all these materials and all the other aspects of this job that do make it so time consuming if it's not easy to do teachers will not do it so that's a huge one yeah and when we talk about this it has to be user friendly and that's part of the integration piece easily integrated not just user friendly for the teacher but also for the student teachers don't want to spend two three classes 
class periods teaching students how to use a tool. Right. They want them to get like a two-minute tutorial on how to use it, and next thing you know, they're pushing out products. I had my students start using Equasio for the first time this past week. Love Equasio. It's pretty. It's awesome. I Did we do that in a tech battle? Yeah, that was my first win. Yeah, okay. It's near and dear to my heart. It's great. All, literally, all, I didn't. I didn't even mention the word Equasio to them at all. They saw it for the first time in a Google Doc that I shared with them. I put a link to the Google Store place where they downloaded it from, and I put a second link to a YouTube video that I found on YouTube explaining how to use it, and that was it. Super easy. Equasio. You know how restaurants and businesses, when they earn their first dollar, yep. they, they post it on the wall? I made myself a certificate that had Equasio on it. <laughs> As what, like your first uh, tech integration tool or something? No, my first tech integration battle. Uh, oh, win oh, against the, oh, yeah, right. The okay. infamous Nick Johnson. Got it. I don't know. I mean, collaboration, I think, is really important and one of the best benefits of a lot of these tech tools. So anything that supports that, we always think is great. We're obviously big on all the G Suite features, and collaboration is definitely the hallmark of that. Having multiple people edit, uh, that's always awesome. I think that really put Google on the map as far as education. Sometimes the things that bring something new to uh, education that no one else has done yet. Right. I believe that's what really allowed Google to get a leg up on some of the other LMSs and educational platforms. Also, one of the big game changers for me recently has been incorporating real world applications into all of my content. I know that's just makes it makes the learning so much more real for students. And it's that obviously that sort of tie in piece that lets them know why it's important or even even if a student might not like science, but if they know it has an application, at least there's an appreciation for why it should be taught in school. So any kind of tech that can make that more possible, letting sort of tying in that real world piece is, is definitely great. I did a lot of case based studies, uh, project based learning, problem based learning. And technology can really enhance that. Just, again, this past week, Newzella. Have you ever messed around with that? Yeah, I know all about Newzella. Newzella is awesome. If you've never heard of it, check it out. It's a bunch of just free uh, free articles that are kind of pre-annotated for students to look through. And as they read, there's things they can click on within the article to kind of share, uh, bring them to other places online to find stuff. Really great source. And again, it's that real world tie-in that uh, just makes it super valuable. The real world problems, just bringing that into the classroom allows students to assume a role of something that is going on, like having them play game commissioner and make a budget and give reasons why they use that for their budget. Right. So why are they stocking the stream at certain times of the year when water temperatures are certain things? They they take data and, and they provide solutions to real life problems. Yeah, most students really do appreciate that. I heard some of the other teachers in my office this past week were talking about an astronomy unit and they were doing a project where the students have to design a telescope facility to like go you know, monitor stars and, and motion paths of planets and stuff. And in the process of this design, of course, they have to learn about telescopes themselves and best places to put them and atmospheric disturbances and why you would want to put it on a mountaintop versus, you know, sort of down at sea level and all these different factors. So in that, I mean, it sounds like a cool project to me. As soon as I heard it, I was like, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. But while that's happening, the kids are learning a lot of great stuff too. So we have a class called Project Lead the Way. It's an engineering-based platform. In there, they're always doing really cool things with really cool tech tools. I walked into a classroom and they were designing what the new modifications would be for a particular tool to serve a purpose. What is this class called? Uh, well, it's part of our engineering program. It's oh. a program called Project Lead the Way. It's our engineering courses. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, and in this, they were making a tool that was going to serve a function. Now, they didn't have to design it and deliver it to a company, but what they had to do is they had to design something that they think that tool would look like. And it really allows them to use their imagination. And then they had to give reasons why they designed it that way right? and what its functionality would be. And I just thought that's brilliant because it's getting students to think outside of the box. Right. And it's getting them to use past data to support their decision. Yeah. I, I just think it's uh, very cool. So That's the best stuff. Just to wrap up here, uh, affordability, integration, collaboration, how user-friendly the tool is, and does it support real-world problems? Those are five really important 
factors to take into consideration when you look at a new piece of tech. Hey, we're still hanging out with Dave Sherwin and Nick and myself here. And last week, we played a little feud one-on-one. Nick got to answer the questions. I got to be like the host. This week, we're going to do the same thing. And this is where the feud gets a little different from the traditional feud. I have Dave here. I have Nick. And instead of pitting them against each other, I'm going to pit them against me. I think uh, my uh, survey has a, a, enough difference in it and enough surprise in it that it's going to really make it challenging for these two to get all seven of these possible answers. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'll read you guys the question. It's uh, not really a question. It's what the students feel is their most favorite ed tech assessment tool, both right. formative and ass- uh, summative assessment. So um, what you guys are trying to do is figure out the top seven. Now, I, I want to preface this with this is an informal survey. Okay. All right. Randomized sample. Most of these kids, I know either their first or last name, so I don't know a whole lot about them, but I see them in the hall and I'm just like, hey, what's your best formative or summative ed tech tool? And they're like, what's formative? Exactly. They must love that. But after I explain it, I feel like they learned something and then they're, they're able to give me feedback. So if they chose a couple, I put a tally mark next to it or I wrote it down. Based on the ones that came up the most, I made a list of seven. So try to pick the top seven student picks for the best ed tech assessment tool. Both, both formative and summative apply here. All right. So let's get the obvious one. Uh, I hope is the obvious one out of the way. Kahoot. <laughs> That is correct. Kahoot is number one on their list. It came up with almost every single student. Yeah. And I think it's because partially because we did a professional development on Kahoot. Right. So I think that is the one that is very easy to work with, which we talked about earlier in the show. It needs to be easy to work with. Yeah, Kahoot's great. To, if you've never used Kahoot before, it's just such an easy quizzing system and the kids... If you don't know, they just uh, sign up with a little code that you give them, and then they're part of your class's game. And whatever question they see up on the screen, they answer on their phone, and that data is collected um, up at the front of the room. And it's just super fun. There's music, and it's colorful, and Kahoot's a a great one that uh, kids seem to enjoy. All right, so let's go over to you, Dave. Uh, It is your uh, turn to make a choice here. You guys both seem confident. It's kind of making me feel uncomfortable ha, you know there was one that jumped right to mind for me and that was uh seeing all my students preparing for tests and quizzes getting that last minute cramming in and they use quizlet all the time it's got to be up there right it, it is definitely on there it's number five quizlet is a great online flashcard type assessment tool that you could use i heard a lot of positive things about it yeah quizlet's awesome too i've actually used quizlet myself studying for I was, my most recent grad course was a statistics class right. and i just went on to quizlet and i found a bunch of statistics based pre-made quizlets by someone else and i used them and they were they were awesome so quizlet's a super cool tool dave is right kids uh kids love that one yeah, being able to use that which already has been put out there by other students, but sometimes they collaborate and uh, and share with each other. It just it brings students together in the preparation for what's coming up. Yeah, that's true too. And because they can make them like a student, or you can anyone can make a quiz on Quizlet. I right. think they like that they can make them themselves, sort of like the what used to, how we used to study with you know flashcards on note cards. They're just doing that, but through Quizlet. Excellent. All right, Nick, you're up. It's time to. Uh... There's only five left. You got to be yeah. feeling the pressure now. Well, I think there's one more obvious one that we can do. At least I I like these. I would assume the students do as well, just for the immediate feedback it gives them, and that would be Google Forms. Is that on there? No, I was I was very surprised about this one. You know, Google Forms, and when I was talking with the students, they were like, "Yeah, we really like taking Google Forms tests over." paper tests. And I was like, okay. And I don't know if this was just a small sample size. Now, now granted, I, I only talked to somewhere between 40 and 50 students. So maybe it's just a small sample size, but they, and maybe this is just the easiest thing when you say formative and summative, they get stuck on those words and, right. and they just take the assessment part and they know that Google Forms test or quiz is a 
yeah. you know, assessment. I don't know. That's probably part of it, but they do. I, I've been doing this recently in my class, my chemistry class. I've been pushing out Google Forms quizzes as like f- just full formative self-assessment. There's no grade requirement at all. They just, they have to take it just as part of the assignment, but it's not great. It's literally just to see if they understand the content. Then at the end of a whole bunch of other activities, they take another similar online assessment using our district's learning management system, which if anybody knows is called Encore. We should just take a moment too to again reemphasize that that formative assessment piece. Google Forms, three questions beginning a class can you know be the perfect ten minutes to to go over like something that's been commonly missed. I think about some some grammar elements and you know the verse using however versus although, and I keep seeing the same mistake. And boom, I ask them those questions. They're talking to each other, and it's just you know a, a great way to begin something quickly, easily, and uh, push it out to everybody. Very true. All right, so I think Dave is up, and I, I right. he's starting to get a little wiggly in his seat. So I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking he's a little nervous here. Uh, I'm not sure. I think this might be our first X. We're going to see what he has. You know, English teachers here. All right, so I'm thinking I use this thing where I want to know what's going on with them, and it's called a poll everywhere. They're you know they're checking out some idea. I want to see what they think, and I want I want to get a quick gauge of that. And just as I predicted, we got our first X. <laughs> now I, I have to. I have to tell you this. It did come up a couple times, but it wasn't enough. It, there was a significant drop off between number seven, which I was surprised is number seven. There's a little hint and uh, poll everywhere. So poll everywhere is more of a business model survey. I know that teachers used it in education when there weren't many of these types of tools out there for us, but I like poll everywhere. Easy graphs, easy display of data. Right, right. But yeah, I mean, it was a little surprising that it isn't on the list. Yeah, that's a weird one. Um, I guess, I don't know if this is going to count for the what this quiz is supposed to be, but you did say you were asking students informally, and I think this might have come up just because it's such a big thing right now in the educational technology space, and it's going to be Flipgrid. <laughs> Yeah, that, that is number seven, which I was surprised that it's down that low. But when you really think about it, like what types of professional development have we done in this school lately? I know professional development, we have one coming up on Monday. We have to realize that students are only going to get it if the teachers know about it. And I know that I've been pushing it hard via this podcast. Nick, you have been pushing sure. it hard as well and i've been talking to people about it and i know that there's individualized pockets of teachers that are using flipgrid but i mean flipgrid fever is hot it is hot and uh it is such an amazing tool and this is something that i see taking off especially in our building next year as we start developing more professional developments on how to use flipgrid i mean the opportunities are endless all right, so Dave, you are up. Uh, just to let you know, there's there's answers two, four, and six. All right, all you guys right. got all the odd ones, which uh, fits the personalities <laughs> of the room. But <laughs> you like how I did that? That was yeah. good. These are the hard ones. I don't really know what. Was, yeah, we got all I need the, a little uh, redemption guys. here. Sorry, we uh, got that first strike. So I'm thinking, got to go with my experience. I'm thinking about our classroom and what we do, and all those uh, you know structured discussions that we we have in the humanities. Hoping hoping that Socrative is going to show up in there somewhere. Now, this is funny because you said Socrative. I was at a professional development, and the speaker was talking about Socrative, and the guy next to me was like, it's Socrative. <laughs> so I'm going to say this is a tomato-tomato type uh, of a uh, word, but is it on the list? <laughs> yes, it is. It is number four. Nice. So now you're missing two and six. Socrative, great discussion-based ed tech tool it is a great tool though I, i've only used it a few times and that, that one's been around for a while i think can right. think back five six years people were just when the tech stuff really started to come in before our school went one-to-one we were just sort of trying out some stuff with bones uh in the classroom sort of like a bring your own device kind of thing and it was it's been uh, it's been really great it's one of those tools that i, I believe is going to battle all the changes in in technology because it's just a well-organized and it has its own niche and it's very right. purposeful in its targets. And exactly. I think it will stay around. All right, so we have two more left. I'm up, right? Is this my you, my try? You are up. I think I'm gonna go out on a limb here. This is just a new one I've heard about randomly. Doubt it's on the list, but what about Go Soap Box? That is the second strike. Go Soap Box. If it's new, once again, 
I want to say that if it's new and we haven't done a professional development, but our teachers here are awesome. Right. And they go out on their own limb, but there's so many things out there. There's so many things out there. And, and we can't just uh, assume that everybody in the building are using the same things. All right. But right. I will tell you that there are two roughly new tools still left on this list but you have one strike left and i i am feeling i'm i'm feeling pumped because i i I think i stumped two uh ed tech gurus yeah i don't know dave do you have uh, any other my uh, palms are sweating a little bit right now (laughs) i don't know what to do it's got to be more like quizzing kind of stuff they like to the chance to quiz themselves or get quizzed just to kind of help prep for you know uh, mastering the content so i'm not sure what else there is within that arena i think next time we do this i have to make a rule no table talk you can't (laughs) your 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 guess was done but uh let's see what you got dave uh you know this one's this one's a outside i'm just going with it because i've heard it being bantered around a little bit it's not one that i know but i want to check out it does have that quiz element to it quizalize i think yeah, Quizalize. This is actually one that I had to look up. It is pretty new and it's fantastic. The way that cool. I, a couple of things about Quizalize, it's a lot like Kahoot, but you get to compete as a team. And a lot of times with Kahoot, we, we use those in class. Right. Okay. With Quizalize, you get to also choose if you want to assign it for homework, which is kind of cool. So they're on a team, they get points based on correctness, but you could also see individualized stats. And another really, really cool thing about it is each question is broken down by standard. So you can see where the students as a class are struggling based on a standard, and you could see where individuals are struggling based on a standard, and they get that feedback. And they're able to say, okay, maybe I don't know a lot about this standard. I'm going to go, you know, read that section or look at that presentation right. or, you know, however you got or they got the uh, information, they're going to go and, and look it up and it's kind of going to help them build their bottom line. Whatever they're weak at, they could build at it. Is Quizalize the one that puts the students automatically on a green team and an orange team? Is that what we were looking at? Yes, that's okay. that's the one. Uh, they, they put them on two teams. I thought that part was cool. It, I think it randomly does it, takes your whole class and separates them half and half, green team, orange team. They, they don't get to pick. And they can see their individual results, but they also are sort of competing on this, you know, one side against the other, which I think is an element to sort of increase their interest in the game. Well, I think anything with game mechanics and gamification and leaderboards drive a extra element not right. everyone is uh motivated by competition but they are motivated at being i guess correct right. so there's right. several pieces of motivation within this product and i really see this taking off like i mean it could be very successful now but yeah. i i see this being kahoot like maybe so. a little bit better than kahoot it in remi- the long run if it gets yeah. if the right people get a hold of it it reminded me of kahoot just the whole color the orange green thing it was it was pretty cool all right so I believe, Nick. We have one more, right? You have one more. Pressure's on. Yeah, I think uh, I really have no idea. I'm just going to throw one out that we've talked about before. And again, I'm not sure if this even counts. It's called Today's Meet. It's more just an online chat room set up by a teacher for your students, but it could be used as an assessment tool. Right, right. I like like Today's Meet for two reasons. One, because it's an awesome ed tech tool. And two, because... (laughs) <laughs> it is the ah. wrong answer. So the number two formative and summative assessment tool is quizzes. Oh, quizzes. Whoa. Quiz is. Okay. That's a lot of Zs. I'm not even I'm not super familiar what with do quizzes. You know? Quizzes also has a uh it has an app just like Kahoot. I don't okay. I don't know if we mentioned that Kahoot has an app with it now where they can download it on their mobile devices oh, wow. and and just put in the code and get in there a lot quicker. They also quizzes also has a leaderboard and also gives you the ability to see data. Does that mean we lose though? Because we got three strikes. Is that what just happened? I think it's exactly what happened. Yeah. So uh, you know, I feel like if I had to make a mini mini uh, victory speech, I would. But uh, <laughs> due to the constraints of time. And the uh, the lack of cleverness. Nick is very clever in making these uh, speeches. Where me, uh, I will uh, go look at that standard, realize that I'm 
I'm falling a little bit short of that standard, and I will go back and practice uh, making these little victory speeches. But Dave, I wanted to thank you for being on the uh, podcast this Absolutely. week. Absolutely. Thanks for the invitation. We had a blast. Uh, cool having you on, Dave. Nick, we'll uh, battle this out in our next tech battle royale and to see who gets to, to do a uh, speech for today. I'm taking you down this time. All right. It's time for the Tech Battle Royale! That's right, we're back with our sixth Tech Battle Royale. Last week, Geis and I argued over uh, gamification tech, which was pretty exciting. I picked Smarty Pins, which I thought was great, but we ended up deciding that it's more just like a fun tool, uh, not necessarily the best in terms of targeting specific educational standards. Guys, yours was... Goose Chase EDU. That's right. And Goose Chase was just a little bit more dynamic, so edged me out a little bit on that round. Um, our categories, again, just in case you guys have forgotten and you know what to expect, are productivity, video and screencasting, LMS, STEM language, Google add-ons, fun and games, history, spinners, choice, educational resources. We've also got one for teacher and student favorites. And I think I think is the winner last time you get to spin. Is that how we do this? I know we kind of change each time. I believe it's your spin, then I get to choose who goes first. All right, here's the spin. So this is an interesting one because this is a, supposed to be a tech podcast, and yet we have an educational resource category, which might not necessarily include tech. And I think we're going to maybe gear this one more towards uh, like a, a books almost, like e- e-books, books, that kind of thing, something you can read. So that's going to be our category for this week. And I think because uh, I am on my week of bragging rights, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue by going first, just in case you pick the same book. Oh, all right. Or ebook. Fair enough. That I choose. And uh, mine this week, and this is one of my favorite ebooks, and it's actually by Matt Miller. And you can follow Matt Miller on Twitter at J Matt Miller, and that will be in the show notes. But he does a blog called Ditch That Textbook. And he also, if you subscribe to his blog, he also gives you a free downloadable uh, ebook called 101 Practical Ways to Ditch That Textbook. And it has all the latest and greatest tech tools and strategies to get your students engaged. He talks about podcasts in there. He talks about technology tools. I I see Kahoot and Flipgrid in there a lot. And uh, he just does a really, really nice job at giving you exactly what teachers need to get started on basically anything having to do with tech and integrating tech into their classroom. Lots of good strategies. That's awesome. I'm, I'm getting real sick of textbooks. I never liked them as a student, even as a teacher. I just, I don't know, it seems just so dry, especially maybe just because the way modern education is. I don't know if it holds a student's attention maybe the way it used to or the way it should and could. So that sounds like a pretty cool resource to me. Yeah, he... I can't say how good of a job he does organizing the whole thing. Yeah. It's very easy to follow through. Uh, I showed actually one of the posts to one of our teachers here that wouldn't consider themselves to be too tech comfortable. Right. And it actually was a post on getting on Twitter. Hmm. And, uh, you know, Matt just laid it out pretty well. Uh, I should say Mr. Miller because I I actually (laughs) do not know him. But, you know, I hear a lot of good things from people and, uh, you know, you just see a lot of his posts and blogs there until you uh, actually say, hey, I'm going to click on one of these. And then you figure out what it's all about. And next thing you know, you're you're on your hundred and one way right. to uh, ditch that textbook. Did you did you use a textbook? I know you're not teaching this year for the first time, but like in your last couple of years when you were still teaching, did you use? I never used a textbook. Yeah. I, I was always told that it would be a good resource for the students to have. So I handed out. A textbook to each kid right but i would just tell them hey we still have a couple more textbooks in our classroom left over if you want to leave that textbook at home use it as a resource if you're confused about something try to read over some of the yeah the pages that surround that topic go for it but i will not teach from that textbook yeah that's pretty much my attitude too 
I just sort of use it for like absent if you're out of school one day kind of provide some pages to look over but uh, so that sounds like a pretty cool a nice resource to use is it a, is that an actual book what, what are we dealing with here that's an ebook it's and an it, ebook yeah it's an ebook and it he kind of has links in this ebook that takes him straight to uh, maybe past blogs that's what it kind of looks like but I just pay attention to the ebook and then anything new that he he comes out with right and then, like i said it's it's high quality stuff it's it's written in a way that a person that isn't tech comfortable can understand it and integrate technology and so i i give him an a plus well i'm i'm a big fan of this obviously but um it's an ebook. Does it even count? Can I win by just disqualifying your whole selection from this round? Actually, if you play back the recording, you said ebook or book. So I'm mm. gonna have to say that's a big no. You're gonna have to come all right. You know, come at me with a pretty good resource to outdo this one. So I've got an interesting response to that because mine is an actual book. Not that that means anything apparently, but it's by Casey Bell. The title of the, the official book title is Shake Up Learning, Practical Ideas to Move Learning from Static to Dynamic. Casey's whole approach with this book is to try and show that technology, and this is something you and I have talked about many times on our podcast too, technology is not this magic bullet that all of a sudden you know, fixes education and makes it awesome just because you threw in a Google Doc here and there. Um, she tries to really push that it's just an opportunity to change things, make it different, make it more exciting for you, but also for the students. Um, which I think is just really important because so many times teachers hear technology and you think to yourself, oh, well, you know, I already put together a nice lesson and I know how to teach the content I'm supposed to teach, but there's always ways to change that up. And I think that's Casey Bell's kind of kind of her message and what is most important here. I, I can chime into to this topic a little bit because I'm, I'm pretty familiar with Casey Bell just through current readings, getting involved more with Twitter and she does a good job for me to understand the steps that had to be taken from the lecture-based classroom to where we are now. Right. And and the lecture-based classroom, if you go back, I guess it's almost been 20 years, since around 20 years since I've been in high school. That puts an age on me. But I had a lot of lecture-based approaches to learning. There's a PowerPoint or there's sure. someone writing up on the chalkboard, emphasizing chalkboard there. We would have a class. They'd we take notes, we practice problems, we do some problems in the book for homework, and we come in and we do it again. And uh, you know what? Even to this day, there's there's a place in education for that. There's certain times that, you know, maybe that's okay. But I think what uh, Shake Up Learning is, is taking that approach, shaking it up and adding other things. So maybe we're trimming down on the traditional lecture-based learning and getting something in there, getting, for a while there was a idea that students should sit for no more than a minute per grade level so right. if they were in ninth grade they shouldn't sit for any more than 10 minutes if you count Roughly. kindergarten yeah. and they should be up out of their seats moving around so that's one way to shake it up and then from there we kind of climbed on top of that and we said okay maybe they're in stations and maybe we're adding tech pieces and i think what her book is all about is just basically going out there being clever trying new things she uses the word uh or the term make make your classroom dynamic just doing everything you were just talking about getting students up out of their seats letting the learning activities uh, kind of grow and expand with the student interests and and i think technology is just one of the one of the big ways that she describes that that can that that can happen so it's an amazing resource it's got uh, it's got uh interactive components she has a whole online community built around this thing too so definitely check out her website if you can which is shake up learning.com um, there's also it's full of lesson ideas and just really quick general tips and strategies for teachers to use who are looking to sort of change their classroom in this way and make it as dynamic as possible well it's really really hard to argue a winner in this case like I'm struggling to go against Casey Bell because of the great things she she does, but I know Matt Miller is right up there too. And and really, if you're listening to this and you've been listening to other podcasts and you've been on Twitter and, and uh, other social media, you probably know these uh, these two. They have their niche definitely in ed tech and you know shaking up learning and ditching a textbook. Well, yeah, these uh, these two are connected, right? Doesn't Matt Miller and Casey Bell have? They have a podcast right. together, I believe. Yeah. It's a uh, Google Teacher Tribe, right? Is that that's, the right one? I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Yeah. I mean, I've listened to that one. That was one of the the first ones that we mentioned in, yeah. uh, I believe, episode one. Yeah, they kind of inspired us to get started with uh, some of the stuff that we're doing now. So 
Yeah, I, I, I feel sometimes that, you know, just listening to people in your profession can really get you up and moving and inspired to do something else and I, right. I feel like that's where we're at right now and and really our aims are just to to help our surrounding colleagues you know get a little bit better at their craft and I have a hard time kind of building off what you said I don't know if I can argue against yours because I agree so much with ditching the textbook that's kind of always been my thing not maybe not ditch it but just use other resources that I think can be so much more interesting and relatable so I don't even know this is kind of a weird spot. This is our first week of four straight days of good, nice spring slash early summer weather. Uh, true. And I kind of just want to ride that a little bit further. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer something that I don't often do as a competitor. And, and I, I think we got to chalk this up as a tie. Unprecedented, but I'm into it. All right. So this weekend, I'm going to enjoy my weekend knowing that I didn't lose. <laughs> well, yeah, nobody lost. How do we how do we do the uh, tally though? Because I think you have three wins, I have two. I don't know how a tie. I think we just leave it at that. This we don't want to. to you don't count ties. All right. So the important thing here is definitely check out uh, Casey Bell's book, Shake Up Learning, her website, podcast, all the stuff they're doing there with uh, the Google Tribe podcast. But also equally as awesome, so much so we cannot pick a winner. Check out Ditch That Textbook by Matt Miller. Yeah, and re remember, when you go on to Ditch That Textbook blog, uh, you sign up, and when you sign up, he gives you this uh, tremendous ebook in nope. download form. Wait, who? Okay, that's great. Who does the victory speech? I don't know if we. How do you do that with a tie? Maybe we have to write one together. Yeah, we do a combo victory speech. All, All right, right, combo victory speech coming right up. For this week's combined victory speech, we bring you the words of famous scientist and mathematician Isaac Newton. Newton once said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And as we share our thoughts with the world via this podcast, it is important to recognize that we are also standing on the shoulders that have come before us. Don't be afraid to explore the educational resources provided by others, like Casey Bell's book, Shake Up Learning, Matt Miller's 101 Ways to Ditch That Textbook, and many other ed tech leaders. Remember, you can find us online at gottech.com or on Twitter at WeGotTech. As always, thanks for listening. <laughs>